Hello everyone and welcome to the Pharma Thanker's YouTube channel. I'm Lars Mucklejohn, President and News Editor at the Pharma Thanker, and I'm here with Professor Lisa Roberts, Vice Chancellor of the University of Exeter. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for taking the time to do this. Good to be with you, Lars, and uh, good to join everyone. The theme of this interview is looking back on what has been an unprecedented and difficult academic year. So my first question is, coming in as Vice Chancellor in September last year, right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, how have you found adapting to your new role? Uh, it's interesting, Lars. It's a question that many people have been asking me uh, inside the, the, the university sector and outside, thinking, how, how has it been, you know, starting uh, a vice chancellorship right in the middle of a global, global, um, global pandemic? So I guess it's not, not the first six months that I expected to have, um, I have to say, but it's not been the year that anyone's expected to have, in, I guess, in our lifetime. Has it? So I knew it was um, going to be quite an extraordinary time to be starting as a, as a vice chancellor at a UK university. I, I guess the one thing that's really struck me, though, is the way that the universities responded. Um, and that's the students and the staff and the wider community, actually. Um, I think we've seen amazing innovation, um, incredible resilience and incredible agility from everybody in, in the university community. So I guess for me, it's shown me that whatever the university faces in the next decade, um, we, we will get through it because we've got a, a, a great um, you know, community of people who can get through um, really difficult times like we, we have. I think priority for me now actually, which you know has always been a priority coming in, is to, to lead the university through the development of a new 10-year strategy. Because I've always said we have to focus on the here and now, of course, and getting through the difficult times that we're in. But in order to come through this strongly and thrive into the future, we need to make sure that we power out of this pandemic and make sure that we've got a great strategy that sets us on a, you know, a really exciting journey for the next 10 years. So that's also what I'm focused on right now. My next question is quite broad, but what do you feel the University of Exeter has achieved this academic year? Oh, um, lots to say, I guess. I, I think I've mentioned, you know, that the way that the whole community has responded. Um, I guess what, what we've always tried to do, and I've personally always tried to have in my mind, is that the most important thing over the last year, or at least in my first six months, is make sure that we enable our students to continue on their educational journey. Um, within the, the huge constraints and you know, government restrictions that we, we've had to, to, to operate under. That's been our first and foremost priority. And of course, making sure that our, our staff can continue doing the, the brilliant research that they've done um, as well. So you're, you're well aware we've, we've invested you know, tens of millions of pounds to try and keep that student educational journey on the road um, and to make sure that we've been able to switch to a different way of, of teaching and learning this year. Um, and we can maybe touch on that more, more later. So I think, you know, we, we've tried to do as much as we can to make sure that students can continue. And I think in the most part, the results and, you know, feedback we've got from students is that they appreciate that we have been doing a pretty good job of um, the educational um, journey. But, you know, completely empathise with, with everything that students are saying to me, that their overall university experience, of course, is not what you would expect it to be in, in normal times. Um, and that obviously comes through with, with feelings of loneliness and, and mental health issues and a lack of belonging to the university. And that's something, you know, that myself and my colleagues are thinking about for what comes next. How do we get that back at pace um, as soon as we can, really? But, you know, you look at what our students have managed to achieve, how well they've done in their exams. Our staff have played a critical role, as have our students in some of the frontline services as doctors, nurses and, and teachers. Um, our, our staff have been involved in you know, critical COVID-19 trials and research into new treatments and vaccines. So at, at the end of the day, it's been a tough year, but there's a lot that we should be proud of as well, I think. Of course, this year has been heavily defined by COVID-19. Even though we're starting to emerge from the pandemic, it is and will continue to be a difficult time for students. I'll bring up the academic side later, but how will the university support students with things like their mental health, employability and financial problems going forward? 
Yeah, I mean, things like mental health, you're probably aware that we've, we've you know, doubled the um, um, amount that we spend on, on mental health because we've seen the rising issues through the last few months. Um, it's always been an issue and it's always been an escalating issue, but obviously the COVID pandemic's really made that um, even, even worse. Um, so we've been putting in more support. We've obviously been working with students to find out what different kinds of support that they need. And we've really, you know, made sure that we've put the budget behind doing what we can. I think in terms of employability, what we're trying to do, you know, in the remainder of the academic year, especially for those graduating, is give as much support as possible around, you know, career development and access um, to, to the job market. But it's something we'll be thinking about for the, those years coming through as well. And obviously, we've got things like the Festival of Discovery, where we're trying to get students back in the last few weeks of term um, to give them that sense of belonging, but that connection to the university, but also preparation uh, for graduating as well. Um, so I think but what it's shown us is that we continually need to have that dialogue with students to find out what their needs are and, and try and respond as we have been doing as well as we can to that. Turning to the academic side, uh, considering that the country has been quickly going in and out of lockdowns this year, how successful has the university's blended learning model been? Um, I think... Uh, by and large, I think you would say it's been good. Um, I, I thank students for their patience and their collaboration uh, working with us this year to, to try and devise, you know, the very best education experience we can under the, the restrictions that we're under. As I, said, I mentioned earlier, I think overall the feedback's been positive about the blended learning. But we have to remember that, you know, we, this was set up at speed. Um, it's been shaped in, in a global pandemic. So we've done the very best we can. It might not have been, you know, as, as, as people might expect it to be in some, you know, um, small instances. But I think what we have managed to do is make sure that that learning journey is continued um, and our graduates can still graduate this summer with a high quality degree from the University of Exeter. I think going on from now, um, you know, as we come through the pandemic and think about future years, I think there will always be now a, this blended approach um, and there are good things about it, but we're always going to be you know, a campus based university and that face to face connection is probably going to be even more important than ever before, actually. But let's use this blended approach where it works for students as well. Um, well, even though the university has spent a lot of money trying to adapt to the pandemic, Lots of students have only had a small amount of in-person teaching this year. And for the first few months of 2021, only a handful of students were actually allowed to be on campus. So what is the university's position on refunding any percentage of tuition fees for this academic year? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I guess the, the tuition fee debate is one that will run and run. And obviously we were disappointed with the government's um, announcement that students aren't gonna be allowed to come back to campus um, until at least the, the middle of May. I think in terms of tuition fee refunds, it's not something that's just a University of Exeter issue. I think it's a sectoral issue. Um, I think all that we can say, we've done everything we can. And as I say, you know, at the last count, it's about 35 million pounds we've put in extra support for, for digital and blended and online learning. Um, we've also waived accommodation fees, um, you know, since January as well for all students, if they're not occupying their university accommodation, we're, you know, about to do that again, because we, we simply can't um, allow more students back. And as I mentioned, we've been, you know, doubling um, support and, and uh, uh, financial resource for mental health and well-being. So I understand that there's not been the overall university experience, but... I think tuition fee refunds, that has to be a, a government um, debate rather than an individual university um, issue. Currently, social restrictions are due to end on the 21st of June. Can you say what teaching will look like next academic year? Uh, yeah, a good question, actually. And, and obviously, that's something we're starting to think about already. Um, we don't know actually what it will look like come September. It looks like it will be more back to normal and that's the basis that we're planning for, that it will be back to a normal academic operation of the university. 
but we're also thinking, as I mentioned earlier, how we can take some of the good things that have come from this blended approach. Um, and maybe there are some things that students would like to still access online, but then have that face-to-face -face experience and on-campus experience, a really rich experience of coming together. So we'll be thinking about that over the, the next few months and obviously talking to, to students about that. But I think th throughout all of our planning, the one thing that we've learned in the last year is we've got to have a flexible and adaptable approach because who knows come September if South African variant suddenly finds its way to the UK um, and we have, you know, huge outbreaks suddenly again, let's, let's hope not. So I think adaptability and flexibility has is, is got to be at the core of what we're planning, but we're planning for a normal campus experience. <laughs> Some students have expressed their disappointment that the university has not implemented a no detriment policy like that mm -hmm. of last academic year. Uh, so can you explain the decision making process behind this year's no disadvantage guarantee? Yeah, it's, it's interesting this one, because even though, you know, we haven't got something called a no detriment, detriment policy, what we have got is our no disadvantage guarantee. Um, and, you know, whether you talk to our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Education, Tim Quine or myself or any of our academics, we can say that absolutely what we've put in place is fair and equivalent to the previous year's no detriment policy. It's, it's got to be slightly different, of course, because as I think as Tim has explained uh, in, in many um, fora and, and meetings, we don't have the previous, uh, you know, parts of the, the year's results to, to, to base any um, um, results on that we might want to. So it's got to be slightly different. But I think we've worked really well with, you know, Students' Union in Cornwall and the Students' Guild um, in Exeter to make sure that we've come up with something that means that no one is disadvantaged. Um, and when we mean, we say we're, we guarantee you no disadvantage, we really mean it. So whoever came before you and whoever is going to come next, you, you, this cohort of students is not going to be disadvantaged. Um, you know, maybe the way we've explained it or the way it, the, the, the no disadvantage guarantee has not been understood uh, completely fully, but I can guarantee you it will mean that you don't suffer any um, disadvantage. So a big issue this year has been reports of racism on campus, including an article from The Anchor, which details students' experiences of racism. How have you worked to make Exeter more inclusive and what more needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, obviously this is another big issue. Um, and in my six months, I'm, I'm very aware of some of the, the issues that have been arising. I think that the one thing is that a lot of work had been done up until my arrival, but it's something that's quite clearly a priority of mine as well. And the, you know, the work on, on building an anti-racist university is never done. Um, it's something that we're continually putting more and more effort behind. Um, I think, you know, we have had less reports of racism on campus, but maybe more reports of racism online. That's because we've been operating in an online um, environment. So um, that's that's been um, sad to see, actually. I think one thing that we're, we're doing now is making sure that there's a real dialogue um, with our student and staff community around all of this and making sure that it's quite clear that no, um, no form of racism, racism is going to be tolerated at the University of Exeter and will be dealt with. I think there's some fantastic work going on with things like the Provost Commission um, and our communities coming together to, to really come up with ways in which we, we tackle this. Um, and I assure you that we will never stop doing so. And also the proportional intake of state educated university students at Exeter has been falling for a few years now. And the figure is currently uh, a bit lower than quite a lot of the university's competitors. So what are you doing to increase social mobility at Exeter? Yeah, uh, another one that's really personally important to me. Um, I went to state school, um, you know, um, I have no, no uh, qualms about uh, talking about, you know, my background and, and how I got to, to where I am. So for me, this is a real sort of personal um, um, priority as well. So. I think we've done quite a lot um, as a university over the last few years to increase um, um, students coming to us from, you know, widening participating backgrounds. But that state school um, recruitment has been a little bit 
stuck uh, and we haven't moved the dial maybe as much as we want to there, even though you know some some steps have been uh, been made. We uh, are looking currently, um, we've got a special task and finish group um, that's been set up to look at this within the university and uh, led by one of our co-vice chancellors, uh, but also with, with people with expertise in this area that's looking at what do we need to do to move the dial. Um, it's quite complicated. It could be, you know, the schools that we reach out to, um, our subject mix that we have for our degree programs, our entry requirements, all of those play a part in all of this, as well as, you know, actually some of the marketing and the perceptions of Exeter out there. Um, it's, it's been good to see that, that that group has already come up with some recommendations for how we might try and tackle that this summer. Um, come entry um, and to university for this September but there are some more medium and long-term um, issues that we need to tackle as well and I have to say I've been really pleased with some of the suggestions that are coming through I think there's a lot of support and will behind tackling that one. In light of a report finding that 97% of UK women aged 18 to 24 have been sexually harassed an open letter which as of this interview has over 600 signatures has called for the university to mandate consent education for the next Freshers' Week. Is this something you're considering and what is the university doing with regards to the issue of sexual harassment? Yeah, um, I, again, you know, personally really saddened um, by those assaults that took place um, here on, on the Stretton campus uh, recently. Yeah, we, we've said all th throughout um, what's happened recently, but, um, you know, all of what's happening around us, not just in Exeter, you know, with the Sarah Everard case and everything that came through um, since then, that the safety um, and, you know, not just the safety, but the feeling of being safe of, of our students and, and women um, on, on campus is absolutely paramount. So again, it's made us step back um, through the Provost Commission we're going to be holding a special day in April that's focused on um, and on women's safety to look at some of these issues with our students and staff community. Um, but, you know, it's making a step back and saying, what more do we need to do? Obviously, it's a big societal issue. It's not just a University of Exeter issue, but we can take charge of what we do here uh, within the university. So previously we've done things like work uh, with the Consent Collective, which is an organization which is really involved in working with communities around you know, consent, um, uh, sexual harassment, relationships, assault, domestic abuse, and, and they help organizations have those discussions, but also think about training um, that, that may be needed. Um, and one of the things that we're now thinking, again, uh, working with our staff and students is what we might put in place here in September for return um, and obviously the rec recruitment of new students. And it may be that we, we do put things in like some um, consent training. Uh, we're working with one of our academics who's a real expert in the area of bystander intervention as well. And she's helping us think through how we might bring in some of that learning. Um, to help our community, you know, call out behaviour um, where they see it's, it's not appropriate. So I think you'll see some initiatives that we put in place um, over the coming months to try and tackle this at our local level, um, but also working with our partners, obviously Devon and Cornwall Police as well, um, what more we can do practically um, to make people feel safe on our campuses. So we asked our readers for their questions and uh, the vast majority of respondents were concerned about the university's confidence in its presence in Cornwall, issues like the pausing of recruitment for a few courses in Penryn uh, at the start of the year and the contrast between Streatham and Penryn's sporting facilities, for example. How would you respond to these concerns? I think that the first thing I would say is, you know, please don't be worried about the future of Cornwall uh, and our Cornwall campuses, Penryn and Truro. It's quite clear to me that in our uh, strategy 2030, Cornwall will be a huge priority uh, for potential expansion um, of what we do there, both in sort of teaching and research. Uh, I would like to see more students in Cornwall. I would like us to, you know, build on the real strength of some of the um, subjects that we have in Cornwall and build on those and, and expand and, and offer more programs in Cornwall. 
So absolute commitment to, to investment and, um, you know, making Cornwall really shine, I think, uh, it has got something special. It's got some particular expertise there. Uh, and it's also got its own culture uh, uh, as well, which I, I, I can see when I, I visit um, Cornwall campuses. And uh, we, we really need to celebrate that and build on it. So please don't worry. If anything, you know, be excited about the future um, that Cornwall's going to have and, and help me shape what that future might be in, in the strategy work. I guess, you know, the, the question you, you talked about um, English and maths and what's happening there, any university should always be reviewing its programmes it offers to find out, you know, are students actually wanting to study those um, subjects? Uh, is the quality, you know, up to, uh, up to scratch? And, and frankly, you know, with those um, um, two degree programmes, students weren't choosing to study them at Cornwall. We have to respond to that and say, OK, well, what should we be teaching in Cornwall that students do want to come to Cornwall and study there? And that's exactly what we'll be doing uh, next. So speaking of the university strategy 2030, you've launched a series of big conversations. What do you hope to achieve through these? I guess, you know, the whole idea of uh, setting up the big conversations is really giving everybody in the university community a voice. You know, uh, to me, the central to our strategy shouldn't be, oh, we'll be top 10 in this league table and we'll have this much research income. Central to our strategy is our people. And that's our staff and our students. And really, a university strategy should all be all about supporting our great people to do great things that have a really good impact on society as a whole. So... In shaping a strategy, our people need a voice in that. Um, and that's what I'm hoping to achieve from the big conversations, to hear from students, what's really going to be important to you in the next 10 years? What do you want from your university? How do you want to learn? You know, what more should we be thinking about? You know, what's important to you? Is it tackling climate change? Is it you know, stamping out racism and sexual harassment? Is it you know, making Cornwall a, a, a campus that is, is focused and you know has a real sustainability flavor to it so what is it that's important to you and i need to hear that so i can make sure that that's built into the new strategy so please if you haven't been involved yet do, do get involved with that finally also on the subject of exeter's future plans how will covid19 impact the university in the long term several years down the line I think, you know, there's, you can look at it in two ways, can't you? Uh, I guess there's the, the financial impacts um, that COVID-19 has had on the whole of the UK in many, many sectors, including higher education. Um, you know, I talked earlier about uh, the amount of, of investment we've put in to, to make sure that we've been able to get through COVID and ensure that our students have had, you know, that educational experience. So you always have to think financially, but I guess the, the other thing it's making us think is, you know, what's the role of the university and its purpose uh, in society? So how do we, you know, set ourselves up for what we do, whether it's through skills or through the research that we do to tackle some big societal issues like global pandemics or climate change or, you know, inequalities, for instance, that should be part of our purpose. And then the other opportunity I think it's given us is, uh, uh, you know, something I touched on earlier is the innovation and the speed of innovation we've seen in the last year has been remarkable. And we've got to take some of that into the next decade as well. So frankly, whatever comes next, <laughs> and there'll always be something that, you know, comes uh, and hits us, um, whether it's a, you know, hopefully not another pandemic, but things happen. We've got to make sure, one, that we've got a really strong foundation and resilience within the, uh, the university, but also be agile and able to respond quickly to it as well. And, you know, I think some of the, the great innovation that's come through teaching um, and some of, you know, the partnership working with students that we've seen this year has been exceptional. We can't lose those things. Let's keep those going forever. Vice Chancellor, thank you for speaking to the anchor. We appreciate your time. Absolute delight, Lars. Really, really pleased to do so. Thank you.